Hi there, I'm Ray, and a very warm welcome to my channel where I make gentle daily life vlogs and talk about literature. Today I'm going to be doing my wrap-up of all of the books that I read in July. I read nine books this month, which is a really good reading month for me. That's about as good as it gets reading that many books, and I'm excited to talk to you about all of them. I'm going to start off, as usual, with the classics, and the first book, or books, that I read was The Lord of the Rings Trilogy. This is really my main project for the month of July because I'm a teacher and I'm on my summer holidays, and so I really wanted to utilise the fact that I had a chunk of time in which I was going to be able to get on with them and read them and not have them as something that I was reading in the background for like two years. If you've been living under a rock or something and are not aware of the story of the Lord of the Rings, basically we have this one evil magic ring. The Dark Lord Sauron has effectively poured all of his evil magic into this one ring and it ends up being carried by a hobbit who is quite a childlike, elf-like, pure, good, sweet character and it becomes his job to destroy this evil ring and therefore save the world, the world being Middle-earth. On his way he's joined by the Fellowship of the Ring, which is a group of nine overall different members of the various races of Middle-earth, so we have hobbits, elves, men, dwarves and a wizard, is very much an in-depth quest narrative. Overall, I really enjoyed The Lord of the Rings. I feel like it has a very intense and passionate fan club and I would say that I did not enjoy it to that extent, like I did really enjoy it but also by the time I got to the end I was ready for it to finish. What I really liked most about all of the three books was Tolkien's world building, Middle-earth feels like such a real place, you can completely imagine it, you can imagine yourself there, you can picture the scenery, you can picture all of the different races, the different places that they stop off at along the way. I thought the setting was fantastic and I thought the imagination that was poured into it was really, really something special. I also especially enjoyed the way in which this book felt like it was drawing on medieval myths and legends and Old English and Middle English. Like, I know that Tolkien was a linguist and was particularly interested in literature from that time period, and I felt like these books drew on a lot of the concepts of chivalry and bravery and loyalty and things like that which were particularly highly esteemed in literature of the Old English and Middle English phases, which is something that I studied at university and really enjoyed, and I definitely felt like I got a lot more out of these books, having a bit more of a wider awareness of the backgrounds of texts like Beowulf and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and that kind of thing, because Tolkien definitely mirrors that style of language in the way that he writes and it's very beautiful, it's very engaging, it's got a texture to it, the writing, it almost feels like a tapestry or something. So that aspect of the books I really enjoyed. I particularly liked The Fellowship of the Ring because I felt like it had a kind of warm nostalgia to it, which the other ones didn't have quite so much. I think the Shire is a particularly beautiful location that Tolkien has created, and I personally preferred the parts of the book where they were either on the plane quest or they were at one of the sort of stop-off locations along the way, as opposed to the big battle scenes which fill up a lot of the second and third books, and which I actually really think are incredibly well done in the films, but honestly in the books I found them a bit Doll. So that kind of leads me nicely onto the things that I wasn't so bothered about in Lord of the Rings. And for me, characters was a huge one. I just felt that the characters were so flat and there wasn't really much of anything to them individually. They were all fine because they filled their stereotyped roles. So Gandalf was a wizard and he was wise and the hobbits were childlike and they were young and sweet and innocent. And obviously the characters did each have a bit of something about them, but for me they didn't feel like they could pass the test of does this character live off the page, like the moment the book was closed that character ceased to exist. I also found the plot was fine but it was incredibly predictable, it was just a clear quest narrative, and there was a really explicit division between good and evil and not very much space for nuance in between, with a possible notable exception of Gollum who's this guy who had previously had the ring and been turned evil by it but still remembered his younger pre-ring self, and there's a little bit of a push and pull between those two different versions of himself within him. So that was interesting to read about. Again, the language was phenomenal, the way that the characters talked was great, but I would have liked a bit more depth, quite a lot more depth actually, to the characters, and I would have liked the plot to have had a bit more variety. It ended up feeling like, although the different incidents that happened within it were varied and interesting, you just felt that you knew where it was going to go every single time, and I would have liked to have been a little bit more in suspense. And I don't feel like I felt like I knew where it was going to go because I knew the story. I feel like that was just the way that the book was written. It almost reads like a children's book, except that I do know this because I did 
sort of semi-read slash listen to them as a child, it's really hard to maintain a child's attention with the level of language and the slower pace of the plot in them. But I think a bit more darkness, a bit more suspense, a bit more feeling in a position of uncertainty as a reader would have elevated these for me, for sure, into what would have felt like more of an adult read and what could also potentially just have explored the issue of good versus evil in a richer and more rounded way. Criticisms aside though, I did give the first book five stars and the second two books four stars. These are a really rich and unique experience and I did very much enjoy reading them. I have since treated myself to watching the extended editions of the films, which I really, really enjoyed and honestly, I don't think I'm likely to ever reread The Lord of the Rings. I think if I wanted to, I would just rewatch the films because the extended editions of the films really have most of the plot points from the books in and the ones that they've dropped, I'm not too bothered about the fact that they've dropped them. Just as a little bit of book versus film analysis, there are a couple of things that rewatching the films, having read the books and also just rewatching the films in a position of 20 years since they were produced, what do I feel should be changed about them if they were to remake them? I personally found that in the book there was quite a heavy suggestion of there being homosexual relationships between various couplings within the fellowship and obviously that's not at all ex made explicit in the book but I feel like a modern adaptation could really play on that and really do something interesting with it. The book is completely and utterly devoid of any romance whatsoever but the way in which the male characters interact with each other definitely had some strong underlying sexual tension to be honest and I think that that could be really interestingly translated on screen and I feel like it's something that if the remakes were done now versus 20 years ago I would hope that that would be something that they would choose to explore. Also the lack of diversity in the cast of the original films is pretty shocking and it's definitely something that if they were to remake The Lord of the Rings now I would seriously hope, expect that they would address and change. I actually thought on Instagram, I saw on someone's Instagram story a post about Amazon Prime doing a Lord of the Rings series and I was so excited. I was like, this is perfect timing. I've just finished the books and I've just watched the extended editions of the films for the first time. And then it turned out that it's not actually an adaptation of the Lord of the Rings. I think it's like a story from the Cimmerillion. So that was a shame. I got really excited for a moment. I'll still watch it and enjoy it, I'm sure. I think any time spent in Middle Earth is generally time enjoyed and don't get me wrong when I'm talking about the extended editions of the original films, I did really absolutely love them. I would probably say for sure that I prefer them over the books in almost all aspects with the exception of Elijah Wood as Frodo, which I wasn't a huge fan of, but yeah. Otherwise, the films are wonderful. I know that a lot of people who are watching this will have seen the films and will have enjoyed them. The books were also wonderful, a great journey, but I'm not a complete and utter Tolkienite. The next classic that I read was a book called Gormenghast by Mervyn Peake, and this is the second book in a series of three which are referred to as the Gormenghast Trilogy. The trilogy follows the inhabitants of this enormous sprawling castle which is called Gormenghast, particularly looking at the noble family who live in this castle, Titus Grown as the heir to Gormenghast, and also looking at the various other characters like the relatives and the doctor, and in this particular novel also the school that exists within the castle and all of the professors of that school, and above all this character called Steer Pike who is a social class climber servant who started off as an a sort of underdog in the kitchens and has been gradually climbing his way up closer and closer to power. These books fall in theory under the fantasy bracket, as in if you went to a shop that's probably where you'd find them, however they don't really conform to any of your standard fantasy tropes, so very differently to Lord of the Rings, they don't have wizards, they don't have any witches, they don't have any magic or magic system, they're purely just a little bit weird and they're set in a castle, which I guess is a fairly fantasy seeming trope. I would probably, to be honest, describe them more as feeling heavily gothic than feeling very fantasy. In the first book, Titus Grown, the new heir Titus is born, and in this, the second book, we're following his childhood and adolescence, although I wouldn't say exactly that he is a protagonist. This is one of those books where it feels like there isn't exactly one protagonist. There's definitely an array of characters and we get to know them all really well. Gormenghast was amazing. It was phenomenal. I don't really have words. I find it hard to do justice to this book. I find it hard to recommend it to people because it was quite an odd book. It definitely didn't conform to the kind of books that I regularly enjoy reading and so I don't feel like I can easily say if you watch this channel you will love this book because I don't think that's necessarily true, but 
I adored it. I really think it was up there as one of the best books, if not the best book that I have ever read. What I loved about it, a bit in contrast to The Lord of the Rings, which I was actually reading kind of alongside, the characters in Gormenghast were really full and rich and well-developed and I felt like I knew everyone incredibly well and I felt like they did have a life off the page and I also felt like Peak just worked a wonder that I've never seen before in creating characters who are very Dickensian in terms of being extremely eccentric and quite unusual and who were yet not flat characters who were an eccentric evil person or an eccentric funny person or the buffoon or they didn't fall into any of those roles really. They managed to be really eccentric and have these tics and funny ways of saying things that were repeated and funny ways of thinking and behaving and acting and yet feel fully rounded and human and you could have empathy with a all of the characters, even though many of them are not at all likeable, you did end up, by the end of it, I ended up basically at least having powerful empathy for, if not really deeply liking a lot of the characters who when I first met I just kind of disregarded as a bit odd and unusual and I thought that was really well done. On top of that I found the plot amazing, it started off really slowly, almost a bit too slowly, it took me quite a long time to get into this book but then it kind of just wrapped tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until you have the pivotal scene which was so gripping that I stayed up most of the night reading it and I couldn't put it down, it was so well done. I also adore Peake's use of language, he is a completely unique writer, I've never read anybody who writes anything like him. I think it's been interesting reading Tolkien and Peake in the same month because they have a lot of similarities in terms of the way that you might describe them would feel similar because I think Tolkien too has an extremely unique and unreplicated writing style but Peake's style is very different and also their books came out basically the same time, they were both 1950s publications. So yeah, really interesting to see them and compare them and I'm really surprised that Tolkien has become so famous and Peake has not because I personally think Peake is way better. Tolkien's pretty good but Peake is way better. I found I felt an enormous range of emotions, like all of the emotions in this book and I just love that. I was at points really sad, at points scared, at points laughing till I cried. It was just a total emotional roller coaster, and I think that books like that feel like life. And when I think about the kind of books that I really love, I'm guilty of saying maybe, oh I like happy books, or sometimes, oh I enjoy reading a sad story, but what I enjoy reading the most is a story like this where you get all of the emotions and it just, you're not missing anything in Gormenghast. It was wonderful. I also found the setting phenomenal. This castle of Gormenghast, like I love sprawling castles as settings anyway, I just think books that are set in castles are normally great, but this was next level in that the castle felt like it had a personality of its own without being magical. It's so incredible how he creates a castle which has such a sense of personality and yet it's just a building, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't have moving staircases or portraits that walk and talk. Somehow he's managed to not use all of those tropes, which don't get me wrong, create like really engaging and entertaining stories, and I love books that have them, but I just find it phenomenal how he's managed to effectively do the same thing and more without using those tricks. Yeah, it was brilliant, um, it was just one of the most talented pieces of writing that I have ever read whilst also being utterly gripping and enjoyable and I loved it. Another classic that I read, I have two more, I've obviously had quite a classics heavy month this month. The next book that I read was A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. This I listened to on audiobook and this I just don't really feel like I have that much to say about. It tells the story of Stephen Dedalus who is a young boy growing up in Ireland in the early 1900s. It's very much a coming of age story, it starts with his early childhood and takes you up to his becoming a man, effectively up to his university career and as he gets ready to leave university and obviously as the title suggests his path towards becoming an artist in his adult life. It's told in stream of consciousness style but not in first person so you effectively feel like you're immersed in the same world as Stephen Dedalus and you sort of get these images and snippets of speech and snippets of thought and a kind of impressionistic mixture of things that are going on in his outer and inner world and you see how all of these things build together to create and construct the man who he comes to be. In particular there's a focus on the role of religion, Catholicism plays an enormous 
part in his upbringing. He goes to a boarding school which is really heavily Catholic. Also Irish nationalism, his father is a passionate Irish nationalist and this narrative and the politics very strongly blends into his life and who he's becoming as well as obviously all of the normal things in childhood which impact a person like your family and your peers and your teachers. All of those things work together to construct Daedalus and we see how both how they construct him and how also as he gets older he starts to kind of deconstruct them and to work out what things he's been indoctrinated with in his childhood that he doesn't actually agree with. I personally found that on paper I really liked the sound of this book and the language was beautiful, I really ought to have liked it, but it just didn't really click with me. I didn't particularly feel any deep connection to Stephen Dedalus. I would have thought that the way that the writing style was would have made me feel really close and connected to him, but it actually just everything felt kind of impressionistic and nebulous and it was like I couldn't really get a grip on anything. I could never properly get a grip on who Stephen was in spite of the fact that we almost got more of an insight into his world than you would do in a normal novel. I have always struggled a bit with stream of consciousness style and this was no different. It just didn't really gel with me. I have a feeling that stream of consciousness might be the sort of thing where some people kind of see and experience the world in that way and therefore this writing is really meaningful to them and really eye-opening and wonderful in the same way that for me sometimes when I read magical realism it reflects a bit the way that I see the world and that yeah you have your kind of 2D obvious world but it feels like it's enriched with more than that and when text uses magical realism you kind of feel like it shows a little bit of that world just beyond the veil that you can't quite normally see and I like that generally in literature, not always, but it's something that chimes and resonates with me as a style that I feel like I get and understand, whereas stream of consciousness, I don't think that that's quite the way that I see the world, even though that's a really silly thing to say because the whole point of stream of consciousness is that it's supposed to be replicating the way that we think and experience the world, so I don't know. It just didn't massively work for me. I felt like objectively it was good. I think I would have really enjoyed studying it, but I listened to it as an audiobook. I didn't maybe give it as much attention as I ought to have done, and I didn't feel like I got that much out of it, even though I did feel like there was a lot that could have been got out of it. Then the final book that I read for July was my one and only contribution to Jane Austen July. This was Persuasion by Austen and I was able to read this when I got home to Nottingham as my mum had it. I didn't have any copies of Jane Austen with me in my house in Congo. So Persuasion by Jane Austen. This is the story of a not so young protagonist, not that she's actually old but just compared to all of the other usual female leads. In Jane Austen novels we have Anne Elliot who is 27 and turns 28 during the novel. When she was younger, the kind of backstory, the like first story effectively before we get the second story, which is the one that we actually read, when she was younger she fell in love with and was engaged to a young man called Captain Wentworth. However, she was persuaded by a good friend of hers out of this engagement. She was persuaded that he wasn't good enough for her, that she needed to find somebody better, and therefore called off the engagement with this man who she was genuinely truly in love with. Eight years have passed by, she hasn't found anybody else, she's now single, her sister is married, her family are quite annoying characters, she's basically quite unhappy and wishes that she had just gone ahead and ignored that advice from her friend and married the person who she loved when she was younger. And then Captain Wentworth comes back on the scene and that's the stage set for the novel of Persuasion. I liked it, but I didn't enormously love it, which is how I felt about every single Jane Austen that I've ever read, and I was hoping that this one might be different and that I might completely and utterly adore it, because I feel like I'm the sort of person who should really, really adore Jane Austen rather than just finding them quite enjoyable and all right, but not the best thing ever. I like Jane Austen's witty observation. I liked the setup of this plot very much, but I also do just find them a little bit dull. The characters are interesting enough, but I don't really deeply connect with them. The plot's quite slow paced and it definitely took me a solid half to two thirds of the novel before I was really that into it and starting to feel invested in the outcome and starting to wonder exactly how all of the different threads were going to tie off and who was going to end up with who and that kind of thing. I did really really enjoy the ending of this one. I found it a lot more romantic than Jane Austen's other novels. I find it interesting that she's always talked of as this romance author but I actually don't usually find her plots that romantic and and honestly for the majority of this that was also the same but there was a scene in it which I thought was really really lovely just I, I really enjoyed it really charming and sweet and put a smile on my face. I liked a lot the fact that she had the older protagonist in this, I liked that we could see that Anne Elliot's 
character was essentially the same. I very much pictured the younger woman who had grown into this older woman, and yet that with those eight years of life, she had matured and developed and just gained that little bit of confidence that she had clearly been lacking when she was younger. So I found it interesting, enjoyable, a nice light read, but not my favourite thing that I've ever read. Moving on to children's classics, I only read one children's classic this month, and that was a book called Under the Hawthorn Tree by Marita Conlon McKenna. This is the first in a trilogy of books called Children of the Famine, which talk about a group of children who grew up during the famine in Ireland in the mid 19th century. In this first novel we get effectively a quest narrative where this group of three children's parents have gone out to look for work and not returned and they are forced to walk across Ireland during the famine in search of some distant relatives who they hope will take them in. I really really enjoyed this novel, I thought it was beautifully done, I thought it perfectly struck the balance between being informative and engaging and not sugarcoating the tragedy and the hardship of the Irish potato famine but also not being so brutally scary or violent or traumatically sad that a child wouldn't be able to read it and leave it without feeling traumatised. I feel like it struck the perfect balance. You would definitely read this as a child and leave knowing that the potato famine was awful, that people died, that people got immensely sick, that it broke up families, that it sent people to the workhouses, that the workhouses were awful places, that young children were left to fend for themselves. All of these things you would get from it. You could still read it and enjoy it and I know that childhood me would really really have enjoyed this novel. It was well written, it was descriptive, the characters were lovely, and honestly adult me also really enjoyed it. I just thought this was very well done and I'm looking forward to reading the next two in the series. The final category for this month is contemporary adult historical fiction. They're both historical fictions but reasonably recently written, so contemporary historical fiction? Is that a genre? I really know, I always get a bit muddled with that as a genre, but I hope you know what I mean. The first one in this category is actually the only one that I have from this month to show you because the others are either left behind in Congo or I listen to them as audiobooks, and this is My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. This book tells the story of two girls growing up in the 1950s in an extremely underprivileged suburb of Naples. It's told from the perspective of one of the girls about her best friend who I personally feel is not a friendship in, certainly not in any form of healthy way, it's a very toxic friendship, and one of the girls feels particularly obsessed with the other, but I think as the story grows there is this kind of a connection between the girls that gets called friendship. I'm not quite sure what else you might call it, obsession perhaps, but there is a bond built between these girls because of the way that they live and because of their interest in each other and jealousy of each other. I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I was going to enjoy it because it ended up being a very different book to the book that I had expected it was going to be. I just thought that it was going to be a much nicer, sweeter book than it was. I thought the friendship was going to be more of a traditional friendship rather than something quite consistently violent and mean and so I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought that I was going to. I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more had I known what I was going into. However, this book does objectively do a lot of really good things. It's definitely a book about a time and a place as well as being a book very specifically about two people and also about the community around them. You really get a sense of this place, it's quite cinematic in its description, it's there's quite a consistent undercurrent of tension and anxiety that runs throughout the plot, which I think very much echoes the environment that the girls are growing up in. We can see how the way that the adults behaving towards the children impacts the way that they grow up to be and to become. The writing style and even to an extent subject matter reminded me quite a bit of Sally Rooney if she were writing a historical fiction in terms of it does definitely explore a realistic side of people. You feel like the characters in these books could be real people but they're not necessarily real people who you would actually want to hang out with and be friends with. It was nicely written. I did feel like objectively this book really had a lot to recommend it. I'm not sure whether I'm going to carry on with the series because I just didn't enjoy really like spending time with the characters or spending time in their world. I didn't enjoy it that much, even though I did admire this as a work of fiction. Then the last of my nine books was a book called Dear Mrs Bird by AJ Pierce and this was a historical fiction novel set during the Blitz in World War II about a young girl, Emmy Lakes, who gets a job in what she initially believes is going to be being a war journalist but ends up working at a women's magazine typing up the problem pages for Mrs Bird who is this super miserable, cranky old lady who Emmy doesn't like at all and who doesn't really put much effort into helping the readers solve their genuine problems that they're facing during the Second World War. This book really 
exceeded my expectations and I just loved it, I thought it was great. I started off just being really chirpy and upbeat. Emmy Lakes is a lovely person to spend time with, she lives with her best friend Bunty and this book was, I thought it was probably going to be a romance but it actually turned out to be a lot more focused on female friendship and it really explores the relationship between Emmy and Bunty in a way that I found very believable and it was in many ways a real light and charming read but at the same time it actually packed a real emotional punch and I found the ways that it dealt with the hardship and the horrors of the Blitz and the effects that this had particularly on the lives of women. I thought that that was really well explored, I was very upset by parts of this book even though overall it was a heartwarming and sweet novel. And with that, finish my very bookish July. Do let me know down in the comments what was the best book that you read during July. I always love hearing about your reading. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and subscribe for more similar content. Thank you ever so much for watching and I will see you soon in another video. Bye bye.